Hey guys, could I have your quick attention for a minute, please? Uh, for all the SPJ students, uh, I'm Louis, the director of events from uh, the SPJ.
lot of good things about you. I hope they're true. <laughs> I need the pen. Uh, because I have to put the pens in my jacket. What a good one. Yanis? Yes. I'm Sheila Coronel. Hi. Hi. I'm going to be your moderator today. Okay. So you will be the last speaker. So what I'll do is I'll introduce you and then Okay, so yeah. the, the pictures are the eight pictures. Yeah, the eight and, pictures that we've chosen. Mauritius will be last. Okay. okay. And, then, uh, and then I will introduce you. And then. Okay, the, uh, my question is so we we are going to show the pictures that what? Or um, the, those eight pictures I still know as well. Well, her sister said she's yeah. here. She's and then you just create and say, oh, those pictures are from one. Okay, that's good. Okay, cool. So, so remember those eight pictures that you sent? So, um, you will flash back if you get to your so you can go from one picture to the next. You just narrate all of those pictures. Okay, so if this is what you want to do, actually. Yes, and it is for like three minutes. And then I'll ask you to do it. Okay. working Hello. Um, hello and welcome to the annual Pulitzer Prize winner seminar. I'm Megan Mulligan, the Deputy Administrator of the Prizes for Digital and Editorial, and I'd like to thank Claudia Weisberg from the Pulitzer Office and Lauren Schaefer from Columbia Journalism School uh, for the work that they put into making this evening a success. I'd also like to thank the Pulitzer Admi Administrator, Mike Pride, um, for allowing me the privilege of introducing tonight's panelists. We're so honored to welcome 2016 Pulitzer winners from the Associated Press, the New York Times, and Reuters. They're all foreign correspondents, which means they've come quite a long way to be here this evening. Thank you. And I'll say some words about each of their impressive backgrounds and that of our moderator, Sheila Coronel, too. 
But first I'd like to note that 2016 is a special year for our office. It's the centennial of the Pulitzer Prizes. Tonight's panelists join a roster of winners that includes dozens of legendary reporters and photographers whose work we've been celebrating all year with more than 200 events around the country. Video of many of them is available at Pulitzer.org. Um, we're live streaming tonight's conversation and we encourage you to tag us on social media with hashtag Pulitzer 100. And it's on all the slides so you can remember. Um, this event was billed as Pulitzer Winners Exposing Injustices Around the World. That title only begins to speak to the meticulous documentation of profiteering, conflict, and migration brought to light by the people sitting before you. When we talk about journalism as the first draft of history, we're talking about the kind of work these reporters and photographers produced under extremely challenging circumstances in Southeast Asia, Afghanistan, and along the path of refugees from the war in Syria. The impact of their commitment is remarkable. The first winners who Sheila will speak to tonight are Margie Mason and Robin McDowell from AP. Their colleagues Martha Mendoza and Esther Toussaint are here with us as well and they'll be answering questions too. Um, together they were awarded the 2016 Public Service Pulitzer Prize um, in their series Seafood from Slaves. They, this team of reporters tracked seafood all the way from captive workers peeling shrimp in Thailand to the shelves of stores here like Walmart and Whole Foods. Um, both Margie and Robin have reported extensively from Southeast Asia on everything from major health outbreaks like SARS and the H5N1 flu virus to the de death of Cambodian dictator Pol Pot. So welcome. Um, our next panelist is Alyssa Rubin, the 2016 Pulitzer Prize winner in international reporting. In entering Alyssa's work on Afghan women, her editors at the New York Times commended not only her courage and expert storytelling, but also her mentorship, modesty, and the investment she has made in the careers of other Western reporters and Iraqi and Afghan staff. Alyssa went to Afghanistan shortly after sustaining severe injuries in a helicopter crash in Iraq. She's reported from the Balkans. She's also covered politics in Washington, which probably con qualifies as conflict reporting at this point. Um, lastly, I want to introduce Yanis Barakas from Reuters and hopefully Mauricio Lima from the New York Times, who um, should be joining us. Um, their news outlets were each awarded a 2016 Pulitzer Prize in breaking news photography for their images of migrant refugees. Yanis was born in Athens and is based in Greece and Cyprus. Reading his bio, it seems like many of our panelists, he's been a witness to most of the major world news stories of the last decade and longer. Um, you see place names like Kosovo, Chechnya, Sierra Leone, Somalia, Iran. In entering Yanis and his colleagues for the Pulitzer, the editor-in-chief at Reuters, Stephen Adler, called out the photographer's ability to capture the refugees' flight with humanity and respect. The winning New York Times photographs capture the struggles both of the refugees and the Europeans taking them in. Mauricio, who hails from Brazil, traveled with a refugee family from Greece to Sweden as part of his con contribution to this year's prize-winning portfolio. Last year, he was a finalist for the Pulitzer um, for his photographs from Ukraine. Um, together, these journalists bring dignity to people facing some of the biggest challenges any human being can face. They capture their hopes as well as their fears and share them with all of us. Our world is full of porous borders and these journalists are crossing both geopolitical and cultural boundaries as they bring light to these remarkable stories. But they're also all human too and I was pleased to see some lighter notes in their bios from Margie's first job at her hometown newspaper in Morgantown, West Virginia to Robin's time right here at Columbia Journalism School. Alyssa likes to hike and also got a master's degree here at Columbia in, as part of the European history program, so something completely different. Um, in addition to wars, Giannis has covered the Olympics and World Cup soccer. Um, Mauricio studied art history and photography as well as photojournalism. So with that, I will turn it over to Sheila, who is just as complex and well-rounded as all of these people on the panel. Um, she is the Dean of Academic Affairs and Director of the Tony Stabile Center for Investigative Journalism, and we're really grateful to have her here moderating the panel tonight. So, thank you.
Thank you, Megan, and good evening, everyone. This is the fourth um, Pulitzer Prize seminar. Every year, we bring to the journalism school the winners of the Pulitzer Prizes to talk to our students about the trade, the craft, the challenges, and the opportunities that await them in the brave new world of journalism. I'm very pleased that this year's winners are, uh, are, are part of a team of reporters that show the interconnectedness between what is going on around the world and what's going on in this country. So this is our format for today, and I hope um, you listen closely because I will impose the rules strictly. I will start by presenting each winner in turn. I will give an introduction to each of their prize-winning work. After that, I will ask them a few questions and then invite the audience to ask their questions for like another five or six minutes. I would then proceed to the next uh, panelist and then to the third. At the very end, there will be one big uh, open forum where you can all ask your questions on any or all of our panelists. So I hope that's okay. This, uh, by the way, this is being recorded and live streamed, so be careful what you ask. <laughs> It is my pleasure to start with our first prize-winning work that we'll feature tonight, Seafood from Slaves. The men you see in this photo were captives of Thailand's seafood industry. In some cases, they had been held for decades as virtual slaves, risking murder by ship captains if they failed to obey. They were forced to catch or process seafood that then made its way into the supply chains of almost every major American food retailer, and from there to dinner tables worldwide. For decades, slavery at sea has been an open secret, but a team of journalists from the Associated Press brought the issue to worldwide attention because they found captive slaves, countering industry claims that the problems had been solved. Margie Mason and Robin McDowell, two of the members of the AP team with us today, were, resp were responsible for, fi for finding information about captive slaves. For months, they turned over whatever information they had received from where the slaves were kept. They heard about the remote Indonesian island village of Benjina. When the AP team arrived there, they discovered hundreds of Burmese slaves, some of them caged, others buried in a company cemetery, their graves marked with fake Thai names. Robin and Esther Tucson, a Myanmar journalist who is a correspondent for the AP in Yangon, took a small wooden boat out to a trolley where fishermen pleaded for help. Ordered to, ordered to leave, the reporters persisted and were chased in a speedboat by angry company officials who threatened to ram them. On the island, the reporters logged the names of ships loaded with slave-caught slave seafood, then used satellite images like this one to track them. One ship went to a Thai seaport, and so did the reporters. For four days, they hid in the back of a small truck, scrunched down behind tinted windows because the air was patrolled by gunmen for the fish mafia. The reporters watched as the seafood was unloaded into trucks, and they followed the trucks to cold storage and processing factories that then shipped the seafood abroad. Despite shoddy documentation and police corruption, the journalists were able to piece together a list of companies selling the tainted cargo. Martha Mendoza, who's then based in San Francisco, she's here with us tonight, connected that cargo to distributors in the United States using customs records and business databases to identify shipments and dates, cross-check against the types of seafood brought from Benjina. Fearing for the men's lives if they published the story, the AP sought help from the International Organization for Migration, which arranged for the men's rescue. In all, the investigation freed 2,000 slaves, including the man in this picture, Min Nant, who is shown here reunited with his mother in Myanmar. Min Nang had been kept 22 years a slave. For a year-long investigation that used classic shoe leather techniques, as well as modern sleuthing involving analysis of databases and satellite imagery, the Pulitzer Prize's highest honor the 2016 Public Service Prize goes to the AP team for Seafood from Slaves. Congratulations, Margie, Martha, and the rest of the team. By the way, if you don't notice, it's a nearly all 
female team from the AP that investigated this amazing story. And Yanis, I'm sorry to say you're the lone male on this panel tonight. Maybe Mauricio will come and join you. Minority, minority. <laughs> okay. So Margie, let me ask you first. This story uh, is not new. I mean, The Guardian and others had reported this is not unexplored territory. And there's a lesson here for our students. I mean, how do you go into a story that has been reported already? How do you decide that it is worth delving into a topic like this? And how do you decide how much resources you, you would invest in it? I think that's um, a really good question. And I'm, I'm glad that students are here and even seasoned journalists. So often um, we come across stories. And Robin and I have been in Asia for a really long time. We were both aware, um, along with most of the other correspondents working in Asia, that this has been a problem for a really long time. Um, many people had written stories about um, men who had escaped and lived to tell their stories. Um, some other journalists had you know, been able to um, track some seafood uh, connected to Thailand, but no one had been able to actually find captive um, slaves and then connect their uh, seafood directly to the United States and um, very specifically to stores and brands. And so um, the story began with us when um, we were working on another story involving the Rohingya, which is a persecuted um, Muslim minority group in Myanmar that um, are being shoved out of, of their country. And in talking with a source of mine, he um, showed me some data and said, you know, that's a good story on the Rohingya, but maybe you want to take a look at this. We've been seeing um, a lot of fishermen from Southeast Asian countries like uh, Myanmar uh, popping up, and, and he assumed that they were just being abandoned in Indonesia. And he said, you know, a lot of this seafood is going to America. And so I then went back to Robin and I said, look, we both know about this. Everyone knows about this, but how can we make people care? And we kind of um, talked about it a little bit and then hatched this harebrained, crazy, ambitious idea that we were going to try to find captive slaves and we were going to try to connect um, their fish to the US. And, um, and that's what we did. And it was really hard. And we came up empty many, many times. We thought about giving up. And then we would come across something else that kind of either connected to something earlier that didn't make sense or piqued our interest in something new. So Robert, could you pick up the thread of the story from there? So you wanted to find captive slaves, and you had to find to know where they are. How did you figure, how did you figure it out? Well, it took about a year almost um, until we actually found the island of Benjina. We basically went to sources um, who were in, you know, labor rights activists, um, migrant workers, um, people who, human rights workers, and tried to find out what did they know. And I, I think it's so often the case these groups that were really experts on this topic didn't really talk to each other very much. So we, um, we basically went to everyone we could and, and, and worked them and talked to them and spent time with them and you know, went online and, and just kind of gradually, um, after following a lot of false leads and kind of spinning around, um, uh, narrowed into this, this, this one tiny island in Indonesia. Right, so it's one thing to know where the island is to then figuring out, then going there and figuring out what to do. I mean, how, what did you do next? Well, even when we knew that the island was there, we didn't know that it was a huge Thai-run fishing complex in Indonesia and that there were actually um, men still at sea there. We, we were basically just going to see what we could find. We had, we had a clue from one or two men who had escaped years ago um, that, that there were problems there, but we didn't know it was still going on. So um, at that time, I was in Myanmar, and I um, got on three airplanes and two boats and took a 30-hour um, trip to this island, kind of on a, on a hope that we were, that we were really going to hit something. And um, I, I was really shocked. At, at what I found, and, and really the, the number of men, the fact that they were, there were at that point six big trawlers with 20 men each on them, and several large reefer ships that were um, carrying the fish back to Thailand. And really it was, um, 
it, it was at a scale that we had not imagined. Robin, you had help from a Myanmar journalist. Is she, is Esther Tucson here? Yes. Esther, I'd, I'd like to, for you to come up. Esther is, the, is a correspondent, is a Yangon correspondent for the Associated Press. Esther, can you tell us how you got into this story and your role in, your role in this investigation? So uh, when Robin went there to the island of Benjina, she called me one Sunday early morning at 3 o'clock. She called me um, saying, like, Esther, you have to come here. Uh, and we, we, we need you here. We, we cannot uh, keep walking on the island without you. So I just flew in the same as Robin. Um, two and a half days later, I got to the island of Benjina. And that's um, the background. I was explaining. Um, about um, the background of this island by Robin, but then until the next morning, we arrived uh, to the to the village of this island uh, really late in the night, uh, and it was completely dark, and there was no um, um, there was no electric city there, except the other side of the island was completely. Um, bright and light and all this uh, electric city, I was so surprised. And as we were going to this like small food store uh, that evening, there were a lot of men also having food. And I started talking to these people with my language and we were speaking the same language. And, and that's, that's when we started to be able to talk to uh, a lot of men on the island. Since, since that evening, we started interviewing um, all these men on the island, why they got to this island, how come they, they have to come to, to this island that is so far remote. This island is so remote that this Indonesian, Indonesians don't even know that this island exists in their country. And it's, it's, it's close to uh, Papua New Guinea, it's close to uh, Australia. And without half a month, um, they cannot get there. So which means they can never go back. And uh, they started telling us about how they got to the island, uh, how their traffic from Myanmar or Burma to Thailand promised jobs to work in the factories of Thailand. And uh, instead, they were given fake documents, Thai fake documents in Thailand, and then they were sold directly to the fishing boats. That's what we found out day after day uh, in the, on the island. And and when we see these um, guys in the cage, that's, that's the time that I went into this company compound uh, across from the village where we were. And I was so surprised that there was a jail in the middle of the company compound. And it is not supposed to be there because it's, it's a company. Then I started asking uh, this uh, man why there's a jail. And this, they explained it to me that um, if anyone cannot walk or if anyone requests to go back home, they are locked in that jail. So basically they are in cage, in cage uh, with little food or uh, sometimes no food and very um, poor condition. So Robin and I documented as many as possible, as many fishermen as possible, and all these little things that, really, that was really helpful. We started uh, noting the name of the fishing boats, the name of the cargo ships, and then we sent it back to Margie. Um, and Robin would have to climb up, like six in the morning, she would have to climb up this hill on top of the hill. There's no, uh, no phone towers, cell, cell phone towers, so she needs to go up on top of the, this, um, this hill, and then she would have to talk to Margie, or sometimes even that she cannot talk, so she needs to send um, SMS to her, and then uh, Margie would by then start to uh, check on the boats. Thank you. Thank you. So Margie, you, you checked on the boats, and then, we'll, uh, then what happened next? Okay, well, at, at that point, we had achieved goal number one. We had captive slaves. And then, um, you know, Robin and Esther, and, and there was also um, a photographer and a videographer there as well. 
And so they documented this slave caught fish being loaded onto this um, refrigerated cargo ship, this huge ship bound for Thailand where all the fish gets taken to be processed. And so at that point, we had solid documentation. We had a ship with a name. And so then we turned to the satellites. And all these ships have, they, uh, they have beacons that emit these satellite signals. And so at that point, um, we, w we were able to kind of, I was in Jakarta at the time, and, and Martha was in California, and so we started watching this little ship as it started moving from Indonesia across the ocean toward Thailand, and we knew it was headed for Samut Sakhan, um, Thailand, which is a port town just outside of Bangkok. And at that point, we figured out when it was going to get there, and then Robin and I flew. I flew from Jakarta, she flew from Burma, and that's when we decided that we needed to um, follow the trucks. And, and I always tell this, because everybody thinks that this is like in the movies where you know, we were this you know, well-oiled machine and we had this, this whole surveillance thing down. No, it wasn't like that at all. We, we basically um, were in this truck and we were crunched up in the back um, with these tinted windows and we couldn't get out because we didn't want anybody down there to see us and start asking questions about what we were doing. So for four days, and this was like eight, ten hours a day, we were following these trucks all over the city and our driver was Thai. Well, we don't speak Thai. So um, the driver at times was tailgating, like right on the bumper, um, down these little narrow roads in the middle of the night, and we thought this guy's gonna jump out with a ball bat and just start you know, beating our car. Um, there were times where we would overtake the truck that we were following. There were times that we actually lost the truck, and we just had to give up and go back and get another truck. One time we were kind of like up, like literally beside the driver. We, we were like waving at the driver. <laughs> Um, fortunately, there were a lot of trucks, so we screwed up a few times, um, but then we, we went back and got another truck. Um, and so then what we started to do was we started to get this, um, the, these, these different company names, and a lot of them were really small companies um, that weren't exporting. And that became, um, at that point, we, were, we called on Martha and we said, please help us, Martha. Um, and Martha is amazing with um, data and records. And so she was on the other side of the world and she's digging away um, you know, while we're sleeping. She's, tr she's going through, you know, she's hearing all the tales of us eating McDonald's and not having bathrooms and all this, but she's digging away while we're sleeping at these different companies and starting to piece them together. And it was um, quite a challenge for her to do that. I'd like to ask Martha to come up and talk about the next chain of the story. So it's one thing to show that slaves catch seafood. It's another thing to show that that seafood ends up being eaten here and sold in supermarkets here in the United States. How did, how did you do that, Martha? So now that Margie has um, defined me as, as the wonk I am, I'll <laughs> let you know, as journalists in this community, import records and export records are publicly available. They are usually at um, pay sites where you have to pay a fee, but many of these sites will work with journalists and provide them for free. Therefore, you can look and see the names of the companies and the dates and the types of shipments going in and out of places. So we just have this list of exporters or potential exporters in Thailand, and we could see where their seafood was going to in the United States, and if it was packaged, what marks were on those packages. Um, unfortunately, if you go to the market here, what you'll see uh, often is fish with a plastic wrap on it, and it doesn't say product of Thailand um, or any other handy marks. But some of these marks that we did end up seeing, first with the fish and then later with shrimp as well, were Whole Foods and Walmart and Kroger, and other ones we were able to connect, something like Cisco, you know, that huge food um, distributor. Well, then you can go to Cisco and say, where does your fish end up? And Robin and Esther and Margie and I throughout all this kept thinking of all these men stuck on the island. And so even though it was very data driven, we all were thinking about them all the time and really worried about them. Thank you. Robin, what impact did this story make? 
aside from freeing 2,000 slaves, there's just nothing to <laughs> scoff at. <laughs> Um, did, it, did it change policy? Did, has, is it changing the way um, Thai fish, fishing companies are dealing with their workers? Well, I think one of the, one of the things that we saw, um, thanks to Martha's work, was she discovered a loophole that allowed for um, seafood that, or, or seafood that was met a consumptive demand could come in. Slave caught, slave caught food or pro, um, products that Come, were coming in to meet consumptive demand could come into the country, and, um, and that loophole was closed following the story. Um, there were a dozen arrests. Um, but I would say well, we had hoped <laughs> that everyone would jump up and down and say, you know, we're not going to buy this fish anymore or, or take really meaningful steps. Um, in a way, we were disappointed that uh, they took a lot of shortcuts, and instead of saying, um, uh, they would say, you know, okay, Thai Union, which was the main exporter, has cut ties with this particular tiny company or that, you know, um, coal storage facility. So instead of, instead of really um, pushing, it kind of took baby steps. Um, and so that was a disappointment, but it was a beginning. And um, it, uh, I think in a lot of ways, the Pulitzer actually brought new, bigger attention um, to the problem and that it's an ongoing problem, that it's not just Thailand, that there's men all over the world um, in these kind of conditions that are, that are catching fish that we eat. I'd like to invite you now to ask some questions. We have microphones at the back. Please identify yourself. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Manuel. I'm in the STABIL program. Uh, first of all, well, there's really no words for what you did. I guess that's the, the can you Can you come closer to the microphone, Manuel? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, first of all, there's really no words to describe what you did. It's, I think it's the pinnacle to what we all aspire to do at some point. Um, when, when Esther when Miss Esther was talking, the, they were talking about how you got into the island. And what struck me as rather unbelievable is it seems that you got, just went in, like the door was open and you could talk to these men, which sounds like something you wouldn't expect. They're being slaved there. I would, I would think they were being hidden and the cages would be hidden. So could you elaborate as to why you think that happened? Um, so when we imagine this island, uh, the reason why we could go in that easy was that island was so remote and they never had strangers like us. Um, and that was, that was the main thing. And um, also the same thing, going into the company compound. Uh, it's, I was taken by uh, this Burmese, Burmese uh, fisherman and um, they were kind of protecting me uh, in a way that they wanted to s me to see how how the conditions are like uh, where th where they are, and when we talk about like uh, men in in cages, at, as you walk into this compound, you can just see them um, that that there are dozens of men in the cage, and you can see that uh, the the way they are sleeping, the way they are living there, it's all very horrible conditions. And we, I would say we are quite lucky that um, uh, it seems like they are not very familiar with people coming into this island. And that, that, is, that is why we could get this much information as possible. Um, and that, that's, I think we were very lucky. Thank you. Other questions? I'd like to ask a question about safety and security. I mean, you, you were dealing here with what, you call, what um, was referred to as the fish mafia. Right? So these were people, you know, armed men guarding all of these installations. I mean, how did you prepare yourself? Did you need to go through hostile environment training? Did you take safety precautions? Did you, uh, no? <laughs> um, well, in the case of Indonesia, both Marjorie and I had worked there for a long time, so we understood the culture, we um, uh, spoke the language, um, and knew pretty much how far we could push, we could push the envelope, I'd say. Um, Thailand was a little different. Um, we weren't, because we had the language problem, we didn't, we didn't know the culture and we didn't know the dangers as much. Um, 
uh, that was a little bit of a, 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 a dicier situation, I think. But uh, the thing with Indonesia, as Esther was saying, that company was operating for such a long time. That was um, 10 years, 15 years. They didn't think they were doing anything wrong. They didn't think they were going to get caught out. Um, so it wasn't really until the last few days that they started seeing that we were asking too many questions, that we were, that we were obviously not as innocent as they initially thought. Um, so it really, we really could operate pretty freely for the first four or five days. We'll circle back to you with more questions at the end of the panel. I'd like now to present our next work. Last year, Alyssa Rubin wrote one of the most powerful stories anywhere, a horrifying account of a young Afghan woman who was beaten to death by a mob of crazed men, run over by a car, dragged along the street, and set afire after being accused falsely of burning a Quran. The murder of 27-year-old Farakunda became Elisa's obsession. To write the definitive account of the events that led to Farakunda's killing and to find out who was responsible, she interviewed more than 50 people. She also traveled to Tajikistan to meet with Farakunda's family. She traced the woman's steps on the day she died, stopping to talk to every shopkeeper and tailor who had been in the vicinity of the shrine. Elisa's story was accompanied by a chilling eight-minute video that showed every step of Farakunda's torment, from the accusations taking hold and the first blows being struck to her battered body set afire. You can watch this video, by the way, on the New York Times website. Elisa's reporting explained why there was such impunity for crimes against women. The US alone spent more than $1 billion to train lawyers and judges to improve legal protections for women. Millions in foreign funds have been poured into girls' schools and women's shelters aimed at elevating women's status. But these programs often foundered because, as Elisa has said, repressive views of women were deeply embedded in society. And Western efforts to uplift women have provoked fierce resentment from powerful religious figures and ordinary Afghans. These are stories that are difficult and dangerous to tell. Elisa traveled on roads guarded by the Taliban to report on Afghan women brought into the police force to help put a stop to the practice of honor killings. She selected the police force because the Americans had invested a lot there. Pretty quickly, she knew that she had chosen the right target when one of the women she had interviewed was murdered. To report on shelters set up to protect women who feared being killed by their own families, Elisa traveled and stayed in Baglan province, which was unstable and dangerous. She spent hours with talking to women who were traumatized and afraid to speak out. She slept and ate in the shelters, meditated with the young women, dressed like the young women, and she won their confidence. Elisa's coverage, not just for her story, but for her in her long career as an international correspondent, is distinguished by her courageous and sensitive portrayal of how war deforms societies. She is subtle and non-judgmental. I always try to imagine myself as both a victim and a perpetrator, she said, and then ask people questions to help me see the world from their point of view. In Elisa's world, there are few heroes, there are few pure heroes or pure villains. For her quiet courage and her commitment to telling the stories of women whose voices are rarely heard, Elisa Rubin was awarded this year's Pulitzer Prize for International Reporting. Elisa, Farakunda's death was not an isolated incident, as you, as you reported. But why, uh, why this obsession with one woman's death? Well, I, I think one, one reason was that it wasn't, um, it, it wasn't a death, it wasn't a killing that happened in a remote area. It happened in the middle of Kabul in an extremely populated place and, and there were many, many policemen present at the time of her murder. So it, it seemed an extraordinary um, level of complicity by many people in the society. And I think that was what um, most struck me. And initially, right after it happened, 
uh, even people in the government spoke, you know, came out and said it was the right thing to do, you know, that she had burned the Quran without asking really any follow-up questions. So I think that was, um, that was quite distinctive. And this wasn't an honor killing. Honor killings are more common, but th this was really a lynching. And to see something like this with so many people, these weren't all crazy men at the end of the day. They were ordinary men. And that, that was what was so frightening about it, because if it could happen to her once, it could happen to any other woman on any other day. So this killing was widely reported in, in Afghanistan. Or it was, it, this killing was well known and reported already in, yes, in Afghanistan, Yes, it was reported right? in Afghanistan, yes. So why did you decide to revisit it and to spend so much time trying to reconstruct what actually happened? Well, I, I actually wasn't there when the original event happened. So one of the things I felt I had to do was go back and really understand it. But what interested me was trying to look at whether justice was done. Because if, if you're going to change society, you sort of have to go at it from a lot of points of view. And justice was one of the areas, um, the legal system and the courts was one of the areas that the Americans and the Europeans both had invested a lot of money in. So one of the questions was, when it's tested with something like this, how well does it work? And so as I began to work on that, I, you know, and, and it actually turned out to be much more, um, uh, what's the right word, sort of far ranging than I recognized because it, it's a question of why were the police who were there, I mean, part of the legal system is, and the justice system is the law enforcement system. So why were the, why did the police do what they did? Why did, why were some people picked up? In fact, many people were picked up and put in jail, but some of the people who were easily visible on the video footage were allowed to leave town. You know, there were, there were sort of levels and levels of, um, of questions about the entire law enforcement system, the level of corruption in it, the level of complicity by people high up in the government. Um, and, then, and then we ultimately got to the trial. So I thought it would be interesting to look at um, how, how much, how difficult it is to actually change something as complicated as a justice system when there are cultural beliefs that kind of trump everything else. So you're an American woman working in Afghanistan, which is a very dangerous area to work in. How did you even get the women especially, who usually remain silent in cultures where women's voices are not valued. How do you get the women to talk to you? Well, I, I was very, very fortunate. I had um, wonderful women translators who worked with me because um, some women spoke Dari and some spoke Pashto and uh, you really had to have the right person for each interview. Um, so that certainly helps, but also spending a lot of time and not seeming to just uh, want to get a quote or a, a quick comment from them because they really, they don't often know how to talk very well because people haven't talked to them much. So the first few interviews are often, you know, that many of the women were monosyllabic, so you couldn't get them to actually tell a story. So you'd, but if you said something like, well, how many sisters do you have? And they would say, well, six. And they would say, well, really, four. And you'd say, well, four or six. <laughs> and they'd say, well, two of them died. You go, oh, okay. How many brothers? And you know, you'd sort of slowly show that you actually cared about them. And then gradually you can come back to your actual story. It's very painstaking. I, some, I would easily spend you know, three hours on a first interview in which I learned almost nothing and didn't even know if I should come back for the second one because I couldn't tell if I'd actually start to get what I was looking for. So where, where did these interviews take place? Um, they almost all have to take place in homes because women can't go out. So you go to their homes or occasionally, occasionally you can meet them in a mosque maybe, um, but, but that's difficult because in general mosques are, are, are for men, but there's some places where there are women's days at the mosque. 
Um, but mostly they were in homes. I would go to homes or in a shelter, you go into the shelter, so you have to get permission to go into the shelter and then you have to kind of get rid of the shelter <laughs> employees because they won't say everything in front of them um, because they often believe that, and sometimes rightly, that they're in some way indebted to the family or connected to the family. What about talking to the men? You said, you know, you, you talked to a number of people who were there in the vicinity of, of, of the killing, but it was like collective amnesia, right? Many of them it said was, they- Yes, yeah. it, was like a, it was like a mafia killing. They would say, oh, you know, I, the thing I heard most often was, I think my translator and I counted, we had seven different shopkeepers who said, oh, I was in Mazar -e Sharif that day, which is like 300 miles away. It was completely ridiculous that they would have all suddenly a vast exodus to Balkh province, which is very quite remote from from Kabul, and and you couldn't drive there at the time because the roads were so dangerous. But um, so you just eventually you'd get people. You just have to keep going until you find people who are willing to say something. And often it's that there's someone else in the room. So you, I interviewed a couple of tailors when their customers were there. Um, and they said, oh, they were in Balkh province. <laughs> and then I came back on my way back and said, oh, you know, we were looking for such and such. And they said, oh, well, one person you want to talk to is that guy over there, you know, three stores down, because he was here. He said, I was here for part of it, you know. <laughs> and so you sort of gradually inch by inch it's just it just is you have to you have to be more curious than you are um scared or impatient did, did any of the men you interviewed actually admitted their complicity in the in the entire yeah well i interviewed people in prison yeah um and and who were there for the crime and who were on the video and yeah they they it, they admitted it, but they, one of them said he dropped this very heavy, large stone on her, but, but he was sure that she was already dead, so it didn't, it was okay. Um, it was just a symbolic thing. It didn't actually, it wasn't actually to kill her. Um, and the other one was, um, was, was someone who was, was actually the kind of the keeper, the custodian of the mosque, and he really would never admit it. He, he just denied everything. So you had the interviews, you had the video. What other evidence did you put together to be able to tell this story? Well, I think the, the family evidence was, was quite um, amazing. And they, uh, first of all, they had gotten there quite quickly and they had been able, you know, they'd seen her body, they had looked at, um, you know, they had talked to the police who were there. So they had a lot of as close as you could get to first hand and sympathetic. Um, as as I could I could have hoped for, um, they were also though really really wanted asylum in the United States and wanted me to promise that I would help them get asylum here. And it didn't matter how many times I told them that I you know I didn't work for the government I couldn't help them get asylum. And eventually they decided to stop talking to me because I couldn't get them asylum. <laughs> and it was, it was a very, very frustrating thing. I, I spent about seven or eight hours with them one day and I'm very glad I did it because then they said we could come back the next day but then wouldn't let us come back. Because, and we did a few more questions through a lawyer but they, they felt like they couldn't bear to talk about it anymore. To, to do this story and there are other stories in this series about honor killings and the police women, you had to go to some places which were not safe, neither for Afghans nor for Americans. So how, what precautions did you take? Well, I, I guess, you know, when you're working in Afghanistan, you go to a lot of places that aren't safe all the time. It's just part of reporting there. And you try to minimize as much as you can the the risk by planning your trips really carefully. And um, certainly being at a paper like the New York Times is an, a huge advantage because they have a security advisor and you spend time 
really talking through every trip. And I'm a great believer that you can do almost anything in a war zone, not everything, but almost anything if you plan it carefully enough. So maybe you can't get to the very front line of a battle, but you can get to the area right behind it and you can interview the people coming out of it. And you'll get an enormous amount and you won't get killed and therefore you'll be able to write the story. <laughs> so I kind of used that philosophy for everything I, I did. And um, you also have to know when to leave. You know, so if someone says, I think it's time to go, if your translator says that, you, you don't ask any questions, you just leave. Your reconstruction of the killing is, is really compelling writing. Can you tell us a little bit about you know, the writing process and the structuring of the story? How, how did you decide on the chronology of it and uh, what details to include and what well, the main theme that you wanted to emerge from? I think with the Farkunda story, it was, it was actually very interesting. Um, and it was really an example, and, and it's a little bit what, what um, Robin and Megan were talking about, too. It's really important to not be afraid to go back over something that's already been, been published in other places. Because there had been coverage of this murder, including in the New York Times. But I don't think it was even on the front page. I'm not sure. Maybe it was on the front page briefly, you know, one edition or something. But, it is all in the telling, and sometimes you can't get enough clarity in an early story, in a, what's, when something is still news, and it actually does take going back and reconstructing and, and, and spending time knowing what the order of things are. And we didn't have the video when I wrote the story. We were still gathering the video, because it was really, really hard to get it, because um, we, we were trying to use raw footage, and that was, that was really hard to find. And so I, I basically kept going over. I had like about eight different versions of chronology from different people's points of view. And then I would try to reconcile them. And there were a couple of people who were more reliable than others. So I would keep going back to them and saying, well, do you think this happened first or that happened first? And you know, memory is deceptive. And it's, you know, you're never positive you've got it right. But I think. Um, I, I felt like I had to remind people how horrible this was. Because I, I, when I talked to editors about it at the paper, they, they went, really, that happened? And he would say, yes, and, and it was in our paper. And they would, they would go, oh, well, I guess I, I, guess I missed that. You know, which, of course, we all do you know, with, with terrible stories every day. And, um, but that made me know that I had to start with the horror of it, and then I could take it forward. I'd like to invite our audience to ask questions. Can you go to the microphone, please? And if there are others who want to ask questions, please approach the mic. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I'm Tian from J School. So uh, I'd like to ask a question on the um, being non judgmental. So, uh, do you feel angry about the crime against these women? And how did you handle your anger uh, when you were interviewing these like, murders? Um, I don't really feel angry, per se. That's not my feeling. I feel, um, I feel like I have to find a way to make other people feel angry. And that's mostly what I think about when I'm writing, so that I and how I can make other people kind of cry. Because it doesn't do any good if I sit there and cry or get angry. What does some good, I hope, is that other people get upset and see what's wrong and begin to think creatively about what could change. Thank you. Hi, hi. Um, my name is Annette. And I was just wondering uh, how the men were treated in the prisons. You know, were they seen kind of as, um, sad to say, but like heroes, or how were they viewed in the prisons or even in the community following what happened that you spoke to? Um, well, it really depends. I think uh, men who have persecuted or harassed or um, raped women, police women, are not seen badly at all. Um, I think it, if you're a police woman, the presumption is you you probably are a prostitute. 
Um, and, and so I think that they're seen as doing what you would do. Uh, and that's, it's changing a little bit in some places, but it's very slow. In, in the case of Farcunda, I, I would be lying if I tried to, to present myself as knowing, because you're not in the prisons and you don't really see them, see how people are treated, either how people are treated by the experience of being in an Afghan prison, which is a pretty horrible, thing or by how they're perceived by others. But, you know, I, I don't think that crimes against women are seen quite the same way, but I, I couldn't say that for sure. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name's Locke. Uh, my question is, being someone from the West, uh, culturally, how do you feel about this as being like a religious offense? and how to keep it from like being an investigative reporting rather than just an op-ed piece. Like, what was your struggle with that? Well, I, I guess the thing that most um, struck me is that the, the way, it's not really a religious view that you, it, I mean, if the woman had really burned the Quran, there actually is a procedure in Islam for, um, figuring out why they burnt it, and then a punishment for that. And this really fell outside of both the Islamic way of thinking of it and any kind of Western idea of justice. And so it was, what I thought was more interesting was that the way in which they decided to do justice in this case, they arrested, detained many people and sentenced many of them to prison. But they didn't really care whether or not they'd gotten the right people. So it was more like ticking the, a box. Oh yeah, we know we, this, is a, this is a crime, it's bad, let's take care of it. But not let's reach a just decision. And I think that was what, um, for me, was the most uh, worrisome was that we, as, a, as the United States, we, we spend all this money on, on these programs and then they don't actually seem to be absorbed at all. So what are we doing wrong? We're doing something very wrong. Hi, I'm Ali. I wrote my question down because I'm really nervous. Uh, <laughs> So as a woman who mainly focuses on conflict overseas and, and being in such an intense specialty, what has that experience been like for you, for you specifically as a woman? And what is it like for you when you go home at the end of the day after covering such intense topics? Well, I imagine it's this, I mean, I don't know, but when I've talked to my male colleagues, I think it's all, it's pretty similar. It's not really different. You feel discouraged to see things where people are mistreated, no matter whether you're male or female, you feel helpless as a reporter, I think, a lot, because no matter, I mean, you, you work at it every day, but um, it's, it's really wonderful when you can actually see the results as, as the AP team did. And, you know, I, I feel like my reporting, it's, it adds to the general knowledge, but you never, I think you're always rather disappointed with the impact you're able to have because the injustices are very large and the most you're able to do is kind of shine a light on them for a period of time and then some things go on. Um, so, I, I mean, I think mostly you, you do it because you believe that otherwise you couldn't live with yourself. <laughs> so that's, that's how I feel at the end of the day. <laughs> Thank you, Elisa. Um, we'd like to show you a little, I mean, Mauricio Lima, who is from the New York Times, um, was supposed to be here, but his flight was canceled. And he and his editor apolo apologize that he's not around. But let me just show you quickly some of the pictures. Um, so Mauricio belongs to a team of photographers from the New York Times who chronicled what began as a trickle of refugees from war-torn Syria that swelled into an exodus of biblical proportions. They scrambled across beaches, 
marched through fields and clambered over barbed wire as they followed the migrants step by step through Europe. Their searing, intimate images captured the scale and breadth of Europe's migration crisis, as well as the commonplace, sometimes horrific travails of individuals lost in a mass of humanity on the move. Yanis, um, the New York Times won breaking news, the Pulitzer for Breaking News Photography together with a team from Reuters. So Yanis Barakis is here with us today. Yanis, I don't know which picture starts, which ones, because I'm, is this your picture? No. No, these are. These are, which is the next one? This is, is this the one? No. No. These are not I'm sorry. <laughs> these are all, uh, okay, so this <laughs> next one. Okay. Yes. So, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, they were nice pictures. <laughs> Last year, nearly a million Syrians fled to Turkey, many of them later crossing out on inflatable boats for the Mediterranean crossing into Greece. Theirs was an epic journey to escape war. It's possible to reach Europe through North Africa and Italy, but the route via Turkey and Greece is safer than the desert and involves a shorter sea crossing, which is why thousands of families made the trek last year. Along the way, a team of Reuters photographers working in Relay captured and transmitted their incredible stories. Traditionally, refugees are the subject of pity. The Reuters images used in newspapers and on websites around the world conveyed the people's courage, their dignity, hope, and determination. I'd like to invite Yanis Berakis of the Reuters team to show his pictures to us. You want to I can give you the clicker if you want. Yes. <laughs> wherever you feel is comfortable. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, uh, Yanis. We're in New York time. All right. <laughs> Jet lag. I'm still in, a, in another uh, continent. Anyway, I, uh, first of all, I just want to say that I'm, I've, I'm very honored to be in the same panel with such uh, talented and dedicated uh, journalists. And uh, dedication is a very important thing in our job. So um, let me just show you some uh, of my pictures. Um, I was uh, part of the team, um, and uh, I uh, I worked a lot in in in, in Greece, in the Greek islands, and uh, North Greece, on the, uh, following the the refugees and the migrants. Let me just uh, show you some of the pictures. So. This picture, is uh, this picture is taken on uh, August uh, in the island of Kos, and it's very early in the morning. It's like 6 o'clock in the morning. The sun, uh, the sun rises, so it's not the moon or the sunset, because a lot of people are asking. And uh, one of these boats with refugees, uh, I guess, ran out of uh, fuel, and it was, uh, it was um, drifting. Uh, but it was a beautiful morning, and uh, there was no immediate danger. But anyway, I call, and a couple of other uh, 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 colleagues called the Coast Guard, and they, uh, soon after this picture was taken, uh, the Coast Guard came and, and helped these people. And uh, go next one. Okay, here is in uh, on the island of uh, Lesbos. Uh, it's one of the big rafts with about. 70 people, and the, the, these people are um, Afghans, usually from the Hazara tribe, and they arrive on, on, the, on the beach. Here is a father, is a Syrian father, he holds on his two children, and usually you know how when our instinct, when we are about to fall, we put our hands to protect ourselves. Look at this guy, he, he, he didn't let his children. So for me, it's, you know, I learn a lot of lessons from uh, working with the refugees. And this lady is a, a two times refugee. Her name is Amun, she's Palestinian. She used to live in, uh, she was uh, a Palestinian refugee in, in Lebanon. And uh, she, was, uh, she was sitting on, on the, uh, you can see Turkey, and uh, uh, it's like uh, five, six miles. Uh, and this is the island of Kos. 
So she came out with some other refugees and I was kind of stunned by her calmness and it was kind of a, you know, a beautiful scene because the sun was just coming up and uh, the sun uh, had some, you know, put some light on her face and she was, she was so calm and I was watching her then I shot some pictures, I didn't want to ruin the calmness and the beauty of the moment and and then I realized I went near her and I want to talk to her for my caption, you know, and get some information. Then I realized that she's blind. And um, it was an amazing moment and it was an amazing experience. And I touched her hand and we spoke a little bit, uh, some English and some Arabic. And uh, she was so happy to be there and everything. And it was a nice moment. Um, this, this guy is an, Afghan, um, is an Afghan refugee, and he is in a bus. He just arrived in uh, Piraeus, which is the, the port of Athens. And for the first time in his life, you know, uh, Afghanistan is a uh, landlocked. Uh, they, they, most of the people, they've never seen sea, or they don't know that the sea is salty. It's amazing. And, and uh, so anyway, he arrived there, and he's in a bus on his way up north, and for the first time he can see the cranes and all these things in, uh, in, uh, in a big port. And this is a, a picture up in the north at the Greek-Macedonian border where um, the Macedonian army and police has uh, uh, blocked the way at some point. This is September 10, 2015, and um, there's uh, some uh, refugees um, from different, you know, from Pakistan and Syria and Afghanistan. They are begging the soldiers to let them pass. And this, this is the same day, also the same area. You see, you know, it's like muddy and it, it had, had been raining for like two, three days. And if you look at the, the, the family in the middle, it was very dramatic. But, you know, we were there. We took the pictures. A lot of the soldiers, uh, they didn't want us to take pictures. They didn't want me to take pictures. I argued with them. I said, you have to arrest me. But mm, I don't think it's a good idea because... <laughs> You know, you're going you're gonna to lose because, uh, you know, other, other people are here. They're going to see you. So you try to hide. You, you, you feel you do something wrong. I guess I persuade them to let me take pictures. <laughs> Easy. And this is one of my favorite picture. It's a father with his daughter on his way to the border. It's a Syrian father. He was going to Germany. And... Uh, I, you know, I would, I would love to be this father. I think every, every, every child would love to have a father like this. And it also, by the way, I think this, this picture proves that they are uh, superheroes after all. Right? Look at him. He doesn't wear the red cape, but he has a, a black <laughs> plastic cape uh, made out of uh, garbage, uh, plastic garbage, uh, you know. And, uh, you know, it's unconditional love. For me, it represents the universal father and the unconditional love of father to daughter. Uh, it's very touching. Also, I have a daughter, like nine and a half years old. And anyway, I think that, that was my last picture. Thank you. Thank you, Yannis. Thank you. Ask me some questions. Thank you. Yanis, I'd like to ask you about the logistics involved in covering this story. The, the logistical issues involved in covering this story. There were hundreds of thousands of civilians fleeing the war and devastation in the Middle East. You have a team of photographers. I mean, what, what did it take to, to do this? It, it took dedication. It took a lot of dedication, a lot of time. I spent over 90 days uh, I counted 90 days on the field next to the refugees, either up north at the, the, the border or uh, at the Greek islands or um, uh, in the boats uh, going up and down the, the Greek islands. And, uh, you know, it took a lot of, um, a lot of time on the field and uh, long working hours. I'm not complaining. I love what I'm doing. Um, but, you know, I, I'm sure... Uh, you know, the other winners know what I mean by dedication and, uh, <clears throat> in, uh, and but, but that's, that's the easy part. You know, I think the most difficult part is the emotional impact. 
Tell us about that. I mean, your pictures are beautiful. I mean, they're, they... Well, you know, I always say misery is photogenic, which is... Yeah. No, you know, it's, it's a fact. It's, it's a fact, and I don't want to hide behind words. Um, but were, were you trying to make the pictures beautiful? I'm trying to make pictures strong in order, for, you know, to pass the message. Because if you have a very simple, say, plain picture, you know, somebody who is a, a guy with a, with a camera, and he can take pictures, everybody can take pictures. It's not that big deal, by the way. Uh, but, you know, if you can, what I say is I photograph with the, the eyes of my heart. So I'm trying to put, you know, to make the pictures interesting, because it, wh what I want to do is, uh, you know, uh, give out there the message. So when you, you, you have the paper and he has the picture and you have, the, I, I have you looking at the picture, the, you open the paper and you see the picture is boring, it's nothing, he it has no, no message, uh, it doesn't give you any emotions, you're going to turn the page. So I don't want this. So, you know, when I take pictures, I'm trying to make the pictures look interesting without any, but, but by just, you know, doing that, uh, you know, uh, uh, click the right time and uh, from the right uh, angle and, uh, you know, in order to pass the message. I don't know, if you call this beauty, yeah, why not? What, what story were you trying to tell through your pictures? Well, you know, uh, I've been covering wars and and um, stories that produce refugees for over almost 30 years. I'm not as young as I, you, you think. <laughs> but, um, so... <laughs> You're not as young as you look, no. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> so, you know, the, the message is that there are all these... Yeah, I'll tell you what the message is. The message is that we are all refugees and migrants. If you look behind in, in your family, you find somebody who tried to go somewhere and find a better life, um, somebody who fled the war, somebody who fled persecution. Look at uh, Afghanistan, look at Burma, look at Albania, look at, they're all over, look at Mexico, they're all over. I'm sure if you look uh, deep inside you, or not that deep maybe, you'll find, uh, I have refugee blood. So for me it's important to understand that you know, uh, there are refugees and migrants out there, and we, you know, we should... My mission is to tell you the story, and then you decide what you want to do. And, and uh, my mission is to make sure that nobody can say, I didn't know. Okay? So... I'm out there, I dedicate myself, my, my colleagues the same, you guys the same, we're there, we tell them the story, and you know, if you work for, uh, uh, for Reuters, we have over one billion, or AP, you know, the big agencies, you have one billion people reading your story, so basically, you know, you tell the world what is happening. So then, you know, then you can act, or you can turn your back, but nobody can say, I didn't know. That's my mission, that's what I'm trying to do. The, the refugee crisis was one where the images, in a way, made a lot more impact probably than, than the text. You know, the, the young boy washed, a sh the young Turkish boy washed ashore in, in was it Greece? Was the sort of in the, Turkey. In, in Turkey, was the iconic image of, of the refugee crisis. What role do you think photographers have in, you know, in this conversation about immigration, refugees, our responsibility to assuage the misery of others? Well, you know, I, I mean, um, photography is an international language. Um, and uh, yeah, the impact of when you have pictures that, you know, are strong and have uh, carry messages uh, are e easily readable by you don't need to read. You don't need to speak English or, you know, any language. I mean, myself, I love um, writing and uh, uh, doing the reports. 
and uh, you know, I always try to, get, to put some extra information in my captions because the words give uh, value to the pictures. And our pictures give extra value to your text. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to do both. And in, in Reuters, you know, we, we do a lot of multimedia. And, um, you know, the, uh, in our world with uh, the new platforms and the, the web, it's important to have pictures, text, and video. And I love to, to do multimedia and work with uh, good, good colleagues. But, you know, as I said, you know, pictures have uh, an impact because you don't have to read and, um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm half blind, so I always have to put my glasses to read. So it's, it's an easy way to pass me messages, and I think very important that if you do your job uh, ethically as, you know, we should, then, uh, you know, you have a winner. And it's my, my last question to you. You talked about the emotional toll this assignment took on you. Can you talk a little bit more about that and what, you know, how you took care of yourself during that period? Yeah, well, the emotional impact, it can be devastating. I've seen, you know, uh, friends and colleagues uh, having serious problems. Um, in my case, with uh, covering th this story, I, I remember at some point uh, after covering the story for basically on and off for 10 months, I, I had this uh, horrific nightmare. One day I saw my daughter getting drowned in the sea. And then the next day I heard my wife uh, screaming in my room. And I thought she's there, but she wasn't. I woke up and I was looking for my wife and I said, okay, you know, this is getting out of hand. And, uh, you know, also, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, you know, the guilt we feel because we, when, we, when we start doing something, we think that, you know, this will change the world and will make the world a better place. And, you know, a lot of us, you know, I'm inspired by a movie that, you know, people, in, uh, um, it was a movie, uh, uh, it's called Under Fire and it's about Nicaragua, and it's a true story about, uh, you know, a journalist and photographer. So when I, when, I, when I saw this movie where the photographer took pictures of the assassination of the journalist, and this way, when the pictures uh, were printed, the, uh, the dictator Somoza uh, had to go, and democracy prevailed, and, you know, the world became a better per per uh, place. And I went out of the cinema and said, this is what I want to do in life. And I'm sure you all understand this, and we all have our, you know, visions and our dreams about changing the world, and you said things about this. So you, you said you want to make people cry and feel guilty, you know. And, you know, th th <laughs> right? this is what you said. I mean, I, I love to make people feel guilty. Because, you know, then you act. Then you act. And so anyway, you know, I... How did you, you take care of yourself? I think, well, I'm here and I talk about this. That's a good, <laughs> uh, that's a good way. So I, you know, I said, I, I'm not hiding. I don't, you know, there is no, no reason to hide. So, you know, I had all these nightmares, all of this. At some point, I, I had to say, I have to stop. And I took some time off. It happened to me before, and, and I know a lot of people. So, you know, that's an important issue for, for journalists, and especially, you know, talking to an audience with a lot of young people who want to become journalists. So, yeah, I call you to follow your dream, but you, you have to know that the dream sometimes is wrapped in a nightmare. So, but... <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you should emphasize that too much to this audience. <laughs> no, no, you know, it's, uh, it's true, but uh, it doesn't stop us, right? I, like I mean, we all have, uh, you know, issues and uh, all this, and, uh, but uh, I think we all, like, uh, we are dedicated, so. So I, I'd like to invite you to ask questions, and I saw Elisa nodding there. Maybe, Elisa, while they're lining up for questions, you want to <laughs> add, a, add no, your I, thoughts about... You know, the trauma of doing these stories and how you take care of yourself and why you do this. At least you were nearly killed yeah. two years no, ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
No, I think I think I really think that for me, and I think I'm sure this is true for for all of us, and for Yanis as well. The the way I make myself feel better is by writing. I mean, if I couldn't write about it, then I'd really be in terrible shape. But if I could write about it, then then it's I don't know. It somehow makes it makes you feel better. Um, it's a good one. And it's yeah. I, that's what matters to me. I, yeah, also there, there is medication, it helps also. <laughs> <laughs> there are some good pills out there. And, uh, okay, you're you not know. authorized to be prescribing. <laughs> <laughs> Question, please. Yes, um, so when you're working on a story that you believe in... Can you, can you say who you are? Oh, I'm, I'm Scott Golden, and I'm a citizen of the world. <laughs> uh, but when you're working on a story that you believe in, and, it's, and, you, and you believe it's an important story, and as y'all have said, it's a very, this is hard work. You have to piece together the puzzle. Can you speak to the temptation when you're working on a story and you believe that you know the story, but there's a missing part? Can you speak to the temptation to fill in that part because you know the truth of the whole story, but you don't have the particular part that you need to, to make this, the story to the journalistic level that we know we need. Does anyone want to take that? What if you don't have like I a smoking gun or? I don't think there's a temptation to, I think that you want to keep going. If you have that missing piece and you know that's what it takes, it might be frustrating, but you just got to and there might be competitive and competition out there, but I don't know, I can say for the fish story in particular. You become obsessed with the missing we piece. We became very, we thought for a long time that maybe the only people buying this fish was Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> 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 and it had I to be I love bigger Piggly than, Wiggly. or not that, that, that that's the only one we could prove, that we could <laughs> prove without any shadow of a doubt, but we knew a lot of other companies were buying it. so. I don't know, if you think, if you have something that is really amazing that needs to be told, you hold off as long as you possibly can to, to, to complete the task. And you become a bit crazy during this process and drive everybody else around you crazy as well. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Sarah? Sarah is from Syria. I am. <laughs> Hi, my name is... Sarah from Syria, um, <laughs> uh, it's basically my identifier, um, and it's part of my question actually, which is for Yanis. I was I was across the water from you when the refugee crisis was happening. I was in Turkey reporting on Syria, and I know what it's like to have all of these journalists come in where there's reporting on on your country and the problems that are happening in, in, in where you grew up, and and I was wondering what it was like for you to as a as a Greek photojournalist to see the effect of a war that's far away trickle through your country that was going through a really tough time as it was and, and how that affected your reporting because you were, like you said, a war reporter for a long time, but I don't know if you've ever done anything that hit as close to home as the Syrian refugee crisis um, when it hit your country. So I was wondering how that affected you and how it affected your reporting if, if you think you brought something to the table that you know, foreign journalists who are not from Greece, um, that if you were able to bring anything that they wouldn't have been able to. Yeah, well, it, you know, it was um, usually I, I I live in Greece or I lived abroad for a few years, but I lived in Greece and then I travel outside Greece covering you know war stories and conflicts and natural catastrophes, and then I go back to Greece and it feels like I'm uh, back in paradise. And then the last uh, several years, since uh, you, you know, 2011, we had this terrible financial, political, and I call it also cultural crisis. And 2015, we had two elections, we had referendum, we had uh, uh, capital controls, and we had 850,000 refugees coming. So, uh, you know, uh, I, didn't, I, did, I didn't travel for several years because, you know, I use this expression, I used to go to uh, find the war out there and then the war came to find me. 
and uh, it, it wasn't easy because it's it's terrible and it's it's very difficult as I uh, you know I discovered to cover the catastrophe of your own country and uh, how can you be impartial when you see your you know members of your family or colleagues uh, you know suffering a lot of people with a lot of uh, psychological you know problems and uh, uh, they lose their jobs and all this, especially in the media business. But anyway, I, I was also, you know, in 2015 with, uh, with the refugee crisis, which apparently is one of the most photographed and re reported stories of the 21st century, um, I, I was in, uh, in a state of uh, shock, um, but also I was in a state of Ooh, let's see how the Greeks are going to, uh, you know, uh, respond to this crisis. Because after all, you know, I'm Greek, right? Nobody's perfect, but <laughs> I, so, I, you know, for me, is are they going to show that uh, you know they're they're good people? Is humanity going to prevail? Is uh, or we are going to be like, uh, uh, you know, in the in the in the history. Uh, the bad guys in Europe and so you know this was uh, put a lot of pressure on me of course I was there and I did um, you know I sought uh, pictures of people helping I saw uh, pictures of people not helping I saw pictures of the police pushing uh, I, you know I, I couldn't take part otherwise you know what kind of journalist I am um, so but it was difficult in, in the sense that I had to to do the job I usually do in other countries away, and I'm totally impartial um, I, in my country. Um, now, I, I don't know, I, I hope I did it right, and um, yeah, I hope I did it right. So, I don't know, did that answer your question? <laughs> yes, you did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Next, please. By the way, we can now ask questions of any member of the panel. <laughs> Uh, thank ahead. you for all the panelists and for the photographer. Uh, so uh, my name is EE. E. I'm a master's student in philosophy at Columbia. So my question might be a, a bit philosophical because of my background. Um, and so uh, as journalists and photographers, uh, who can decide which story to tell to the public and how to reconstruct them? Have you ever questioned or thought about whether you should cover a story, or if so, how do you reconstruct them? Um, I hear some of you saying the feeling of ang angry, sad, um, upset, and sometimes even when you don't have a personal anger towards something that you believe it is right for the public to feel the anger. So I just wonder in this process if you have questioned what justice is actually is and the difference between what is injustice for you and for the public. So I'm not looking for like a theory to justify it, but I just really am curious about like your personal reflection on this. So thank you. Elisa, do you want to take that question? Uh, this is the Rubin philosophy of yeah. journalism. Um, I, I, I would say I, I certainly think about that I, I, all the time, and I imagine that other people do, other journalists do too, because if you're working in a, in a foreign culture, you're very aware that what you might think of as right or a priority might not be to someone else. So one of the things that at least I do a lot is trying to, I, I ask people what, you know, what did you think about this or that event? I mean, did you, did, did this seem wrong, right, warranted? You know, you, you try to understand how it's seen in the culture. And then, and usually what turns out is that it's seen in a variety of different ways because there are many, you know, cultures aren't uniform by any means, and and so you you think about that, and then you can really figure out where your biases are. But that was one of the things that was always in my mind in Afghanistan, because clearly, the whole way that Afghan society is organized, and it's not just Islam; it's also about a you know a fairly isolated. Um, until recently very rural world, and I don't know how that works, so I have to be told 
how, how it works, but also hear what, how they want it to work, how different people want it to work, and then, and then you tell your story cognizant of those things. Thank you. Next, please. Hi, my name's Nafisa, um, and this question is for all the panelists. Uh, when it comes to this type of journalism, um, obviously you encounter an enormous amount of injustice. So, um, whether it be you know men unfairly uh, jailed in cages, or a man with his children falling off a boat into the water, um, and without any judgment, um, where do you draw the line between standing back and documenting um, as a means to an end? and stepping in and doing what little you can to help? It's a tough one. Who wants to take that question? Robin? Margie? <laughs> Where do you draw the line between documenting and then trying to help? Where is... Can I? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I, I had this dilemma many times. But, you know, I feel that by working, I help. Because, you know, I tell the story a lot of times, not only in, the, you know, in this story, in every story. I had people coming to me and, you know, like, man, please tell our story. This is, you know, they, they, a lot of people see you as a life jacket, as uh, somebody who can help. And by telling the story, you help. I, I said before, you know, uh, uh, I will tell you the story and then you decide what to do. But also a lot of times we've seen, you know, that governments and organizations are under, under pressure because of our stories. Imagine if, if uh, nobody was on the Greek islands, no journalists, no, no nobody, and these people would come. Then, you know, the police, the army, the locals who didn't like them, they would do whatever they want. Maybe they would shoot them, on, you know, before they even land. So we were there, and I, I feel strongly that we protected them. And then they would come out and they would tell us the story, please do something. So I, I do help uh, when I feel that I have to do physically something. So for example, you know, there is a situation when somebody has a, an issue, you know, is wounded or uh, whatever. And I, am, I feel that I have to help. If, if I am surrounded by 20 doctors, I won't do it. I will take pictures of the doctors and use these pictures as an example. You know, tell the story of the doctors or, or, or the volunteers or whoever. But if I feel that I am the person who has to actually do something, I will, I will leave the camera and I will help without telling, you know, uh, people. Because, you know, when you do this, you don't want to tell people that, you know, I'm the guy, I help. <laughs> we see this sometimes, you know. <laughs> so anyway, you know, it's part of the, my values. So do, do any of you want to take that question, how do you negotiate this? Is when is, you know, just being there and telling the story, when is that enough and when it ever isn't? I think it really depends in each particular case. Um, I think in the fishing story, it was a really, that was a really unique yes. um, story. Nobody else knew these men would, were there. If we published the story and allowed their names to be used, um, they would have, could have been beaten, they could have been killed. If we blurred their faces, um, the power of the, the, the men who were brave enough to speak and risk their lives, um, we take away the power of their story which was also what, what would free them. So, I mean, in that, that, that Well, was let me just re remind them that the AP did something extraordinary in this case, because it reported the slaves to um, the International Organization for Migration, which then arranged a rescue. Right, yeah. so the men who, who were actually um, quoted in the story or whose faces we used in the photographs or in the video, we, um, through Margie's source at the IOM, made sure that the Marine police could get them off the island before we published the story. So, so you felt responsible for the safety of, of the people you were Not just the safety, but also that the story that they told and the power of the story came out. You know, it's, it wasn't really up to us to decide, should we blur their faces? Should we, should we take out their names? 
that changes the story, that takes away their voice. Alisa, do you want to oh. weigh in in this? No, I, 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 I know. I just thought what Rob, Robin said was right also about it being a really case by case. And I, I think the hardest thing in these stories in foreign, in foreign places is that by publishing them, you can really harm people. Mm. And, and leave them very, very vulnerable to, to, uh, to being killed or imprisoned or beaten. You, you, you don't even know what it will be. So you have to be, you sometimes have to not tell a story you want to tell until you're really 100% sure you're not going to just make someone's life worse. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Next question. Hello again. I wrote my question down. It's for Yanis, because it's more coherent if I write it down. So in taking photos, photos capture a moving moment in time. How do you manage to capture these moments and then go forth and learn of the people you're capturing without interrupting what they're going through? Because you describe each of these photos that we're watching, but these are moments that are actually happening. How are you able to then go back and get you know, insight into the people that are experiencing these things? I, can, I, I, I couldn't hear you. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. I mean, you know, it's the, the impact of my work. Uh, <laughs> can, you, can you speak louder and I more will. slowly? Please? Can you hear yeah. me now? Yeah? Okay. okay. So I said, in taking photos, photos capture a moving moment in time. How do you manage to capture these moments and then go forth and learn of the people you're capturing without interrupting what they're going through? Because you do describe um, the photos that you're taking, but they're moving moments in time. How are you able to then, you know, stop and ask these people, you know, what is it? Who are you? You know, tell me about your life, and then report on that when you can see that they're going through such a turbulent time. Well, you know, every time is a different uh, situation, and you know, the experience experience helps a lot to judge. Uh, you know, a lot of times you take pictures, and then you feel that these people they don't want to be photographed or they tell you stop, and you have to respect this. And, uh, you know, we, we said before that sometimes you actually harm people uh, instead of helping. So I always, I'm always aware of this, and sometimes they will tell me, please, don't take pictures because my family is in Syria, and if they see, and so it, it can be very complicated. So you need to respect the people you're taking photographs, or you interview, or you're doing a story, and make sure that you're not going to harm them instead of, uh, you know, help help them. And it's, it, well, you know, you learn with uh, experience, and you read the messages, and you, you the, the body language, and and everything, and also. You know, usually people have their problems and they're doing their own thing. And if you're not dressed in uh, like a clown or you don't jump up and down or you make a lot of noise, people, they don't really care much about you. So you can be a little bit like a, um, a invisible, which is, is good. I more so meant like how are you able to stop them as they're like for instance the picture of well I follow them I walk with them oh, okay. <laughs> of course yeah you know I, I want sometimes I offer them to to you know if it's like a situation when an old lady and now I don't want to play the good guy but you know obviously I'm a human and I you know I have family and everything so sometimes as I said I would stop and you know pack the car with people um, and uh, apparently in, in Greece there was a law that you know if you pick up uh, refugees and migrants, uh, the police can uh, can uh, you know persecute you uh, you know uh, for uh, human trafficking, and and so you have to be very careful. So I took some uh, chances a few times, thinking okay if they stop me I'm going to say look I'm just trying to help these people and and uh, actually somebody was. Um, yeah, arrested for doing this, and uh, anyway, um, so yeah, you know, every time is different. You walk with them, or you, the the body language and the way, uh, you know, if you are honest, I tell you, they f they feel honesty. So you go there and you say, hi, my name is Yanis, and I work for Reuters, and you know, I, I'm taking your pictures and let me know what is your name, what is your story, and usually they say yes. If they say no, okay, you respect, but you have to be very honest. You know, usually I tell them, look, I, I, you know, I don't believe in miracles, 
but I, I hope that I make some people feel guilty or make some people feel ashamed for this situation and help you, but I can't promise. So, you, I, I, you know, I'm always very straight and honest and, um, you know, people open up. They, you know, they talk to me. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we're welcome. Next, please. Hi, my name's Elise, thank you for coming. Uh, I have a question about your editorial process. All of your stories sort of document extremes of human suffering and there's sort of varying degrees of like graphic detail. How do you choose where to draw the line uh, with the details that maybe are, are very extreme and sensitive? How do you choose which ones to include for the story and, and what should be left out? I think that, you know, we talk a lot about our stories and, um, I mean, you know, we, we try to, I think, make our stories as realistic as possible. I think that's the goal for all of us. Um, we don't want to whitewash anything that we see. Obviously, there are times when you can't put everything in that you want to put in for various reasons. but. You know, I think that uh, you have long talks with your editor, and we, you know, as a team, um, we have long talks often, too, about, you know, what we want to say and what we don't want to say. And it's not just about, um, you know, what to put in and what to leave out, or it's, it's also about how to construct it and the most powerful way t to construct the stories. And I think that, you know, y you look at the stories presented here tonight, I mean, I, I don't know how much time went into the reporting versus the writing, but I can tell you from, from our experience that um, you know, it's something that, that we think about so much because, again, it's like a photograph. You know, it, it, anybody can take a picture and anybody can write a story, but you know, if, you, if you find that story and you find those details, and I think that a good journalist will um, will just dig. I mean, for me, when I'm interviewing somebody, I drive everyone around me crazy. So if the photographer is with me and the videographer is with me, they just get so annoyed and they usually just leave me because I will just sit with the person and talk to them for sometimes hours at a time. And I get a sense of, you know, during the interview, okay, I know this person is going to be somebody that I'm going to want to spend a lot of time with. And in one case, you know, we followed the man home who had been in Indonesia for 22 years, and we spent a lot of time with him in Indonesia and also um, in in Myanmar as well, getting a sense of his story and and himself as well. And and so I think that you know it's something to be very mindful of when you are working on a story. Um, you know, how can you make it as powerful? as possible, and, and again, there's never enough reporting. You can never ever, I don't think, report enough on a story. There's always more to get. Hi, uh, my name is Lulu. I'm from J School. Um, uh, I, I originally from China, so I first read the fish slavery story in Chinese. Uh, I'm very <laughs> happy to see the people behind the story. So my question is, after so much efforts, do you think you have the result uh, after the story published? Do you have the expected result? If you don't have the expected result, do you feel disappointed? Well, we didn't expect 2,000 men would be freed, I think, when we went into this. Um, I think we are happy that there is attention on this issue a little more than when we went and started reporting on it. Um, but Thailand was only one example, and there are thousands of men still out there. Um, so I think we could report the story for the rest of our careers if we wanted to. <laughs> I think it's going to take a long time to fix that, to fix this problem. Thank you. Hi again. Um, 
A couple of questions, if I may. One is uh, about metho methodology. Uh, that one is for Ms. Rubin. Uh, the other one is a rather emotional one. Um, when, when, for somebody who's just starting in, in the profession, right, could, could you explain what, what, how do you do that? In other words, I imagine somebody tells me, Manuel, you're gonna go to Kabul and uh, re re investigate the murder of this woman. I land in Kabul, I figure first thing I do is I probably look, at, look, look for their family. But then, then what? Uh, who is with you? Did you plan anything before you went? Uh, did you contact people in um, Afghanistan? Did you, uh, just a brief summary of how you started the whole thing. Well, I had, I had been working in Afghanistan um, for about four years um, before I decided to do this particular story. I had left Afghanistan but went back to do it. Um, so I think a lot like um, the uh, AP team, you know, they, they had years and years in the region, and so they had a lot of depth of knowledge about how, how it works. And, you know, you, you just sit down when you're going to do a story, it, as you, you know, for any, any story that's going to be complicated, and you make a list of what are the kinds of people I would need to talk to. Well, let's see, I'd need to talk to policemen and lawyers and people who were there and family members and you know you just break it down and then you start to work with a local reporter or translator to see how whether you can find those people and then you know you some of them you'll be able to find easily some of them are officials some of them are going to be people where you don't know how to reach them but you try to get some other people who might know how to reach them and you just keep going until, until you've got all the pieces. I mean, at one point we went to her house, Farkunda's house, no one lived there, we thought, but it turned out actually that some people did live there and it was her uncle and, and, uh, and his children, um, but, but her, her family had, had fled. And you know, for whatever reason, they let us come in and showed us her, her bedroom and the house and you know, that was just, Doing it on a on a on a whim or on a chance to see if we could even get it. You know, we didn't know if we'd even find the house, but it turned out everyone knew where the house was. So you just you just keep going with down sort of you make a list of all your potential um, sources, and then you follow each one till you till you get as close as you possibly can. Thank you. Um, if I may, if the, the next question is for uh, Ms. Marson and Ms. McDowell. Did you meet with any of the freed slaves after they had been freed? Uh, did they know uh, they were pretty much freed because of you? And if you did meet them, do please tell us the details. Yes, so, um, you know, we're in regular contact with a lot of them. And, and yes, I mean, I think um, for us, we, we did this, uh, after the slaves were, were freed and taken to this island, um, kind of, uh, what, 12 or 18 hours from Benjina, they were held in this makeshift area. And um, we went there and we took uh, these surveys that we had written up in three different languages and we distributed them to, I think, 300 guys. And um, we, we built a database and, and Martha and I, um, we, we um, well, Esther translated a lot of the Burmese ones and Martha and I and, and Robin too, we, we added them to the to the database, and um, you know one of the things that we saw that was was just so amazing was that every now and then you'd, you'd get something from someone, and they would say, you know, my life was really awful, um, but I just want to thank the people who helped to free us. You know, now we have our lives back, and you know we've been thanked by these guys, and and they, you know, they they know. I mean, especially Esther. Um, everybody, I think. Everybody knows Esther. Um, she's their hero. So, so yeah, I mean, um, unfortunately, you know, as Robin said, for our story, um, you know, we would like to say that we, we helped to free these men and they went home and, and their lives are now great and every, it's a happy ending, but it's unfortunately in a lot of cases not. Um, a lot of these men went home with nothing. They have... Um, a lot of 
psychological problems now that they're dealing with. Um, their families are very poor. Um, they are an, a financial burden on their families, and they feel very ashamed. And um, you know, in a couple of cases, we know guys who have said, "Look, we, we can't find work in Burma," and so you know, the only thing we know how to do is fish. And so they've ended up um, you know thinking that they're vetting um, you know through friends or friends of friends and getting on to uh, you know good boats. And they've they've wound up back at sea in a couple of cases. You know, they were at sea for six months without touching land and then just dumped, you know, in Thailand with no money. Um, we've, we've heard numerous stories of these types of things. So, um, you know, a lot of these men were never compensated for the work that they did as well. So it's been a real, a real struggle. Thank you. Ida. Yes. Hi. Congratulations for amazing stories. Um, I just wanted to ask you how crucial it was to pick a fixer to work on these stories. How did you go about picking someone? And also, I'm not sure about the language, but I always find it fascinating to report in a country where you don't necessarily speak the language. So I, I would love to hear your thoughts about can, can, this. Can I ask the others to ask their questions and then we just have one round where okay. the, our panelists answer that. So fixer question and then yes. Hi, my name is Shana. I'm from the J School. Thank you all for being here. Um, my question is, uh, a few of you have mentioned that you know you never feel like you've reported enough. So how do you decide when to stop and to start writing? Okay. Um, hi, my name is uh, Nadim. I have a question for Lisa. Um, I spoke to a friend of mine, a war correspondent, and they said to me that when they were uh, reporting in Iraq, that there comes a point when they were no longer felt that they were able to relate to their life back home uh, if they continued working in that environment. So I wanted to know, when do you know, when is the time to call it a day? OK, all good questions. Who wants to take the fixer store, um, question? How do you choose a fixer? How do you navigate working in a foreign language, being reliant on a fixer's translation? How do you find a fixer? How do you find and choose a fixer? Yeah. Can I? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Well, you know, fixers and drivers are very important for our job. And especially, you know, if you find a, a good fixer that can drive and can speak good English, <laughs> why not? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so, yeah, because, you know, you have, to, you have to think about the financial situation of the media. It was, I remember in the 90s, for example, in Yugoslavia. You like that? Huh? Yeah, it's so true. <laughs> It's true, it's true. I remember in the 90s in, uh, in Yugoslavia, for example, a, you know, we had a lot of money, so you can pay, or in Chechnya, I remember Chechnya was one of the, you know, very extreme places, so I remember 94, 95, I used to pay $300 the driver and another $300 the translator. You cannot do this today. So anyway, so that's why, you, uh, but it, they're very important. The way I find, I think, you know, more or less, uh, everybody has the same answer. Um, you know, you, you find your local uh, contact somehow. I mean, you're a journalist, you have to find it. Sometimes there is a hotel or an area where people hang out, and you, you look for, you ask your colleagues, or you, you know, you, you use your knowledge or your instinct to find a, uh, and, and usually uh, with, with the fixers is you, uh, what, what I do is I ask them a kind of semi-complicated question to see if they really understand English or not, <laughs> right? And then, uh, you know, usually, and if they say, so I say, you know, you, you, are you a really, really bad person, right? And he says, yes, then he's not the right person. Uh, it's like, you know, children. Um, I, yeah. How? <laughs> yes, okay. So, yes. So then when you find the, the right people, uh, it's, it's very important because, you know, this person is your, your ears, basically, and, and, and your eyes. And if you can 
uh, they're not uh, you know, ready-made. There is no uh, place where you find fixers. So you have to educate your fixer. And a, a lot of times I'm trying to, um, you know, I tell them what I want, you know, like uh, have your ears open, listen to the radio, uh, it, you know, talk with your friends, find out what's going on, um, you know, if they have some uh, inside information, if they know, the, you know, somebody in the police or in the army, but also I try to inspire them. So, for example, in Afghanistan I had this young um, a student of uh, medicine, and I found the, I found him in up in north Afghanistan, and I I kind of educate him, and I I uh, you know I said, look, you see all these people, they're they're trying to stop us from telling the truth, and our job is even by taking risks. Uh, to tell the truth around the world. This is how we're going to help your country. And he was like, wow, yeah, I like that and this and that. This guy is our chief photographer in Asia now. He's our chief photographer in Asia because he loved the whole thing and he believed in the idea and he, you know. So it's, it's, it's super crucial, it's super important. And also, to, you know, to have somebody who tells you the truth and is not hiding things and is not, he doesn't have an agenda, which is very dangerous. All right, so I'd, I'd like to ask the rest of our panel to take all those three questions in like one big summation. Um, how important is a fixer? When do you stop reporting? And how do you relate to life back home? if you've been elsewhere for so long? Um, well, yeah, I mean, fixer is, is vital. Y you, you, can't, you can't operate. If you don't speak the language, I mean, you must have, and oftentimes the fixer and the translator is the same person. And it's just, y you can't, they are your eyes and your ears in the country. Um, they know all of the cultural sensitivities that you may or may not know. Um, they're also, you know, the person who has your back. The fixer is the person who says, okay, we need to leave. Things are getting dangerous or we shouldn't be here or, hey, you know, <laughs> hey, I know a secret way we can do this and we can work this and, hey, I know this and we can go this way and I know this person and that, that person can lead us to this person. And so, you know, it, it, it is. It's absolutely crucial. Um, when do you stop reporting? when your editor makes you stop reporting. That's when you stop. I think, I, I don't know, I, we, we, we never stop. We never stop reporting. Even I think when we're in final draft mode, we're still questioning things and asking, oh, maybe we should call this person. Oh, maybe we should look at this. Oh, maybe there's some documents we can get here. I mean, right up until publishing. And I think that's really important, you know, to, to always be, even when you think you've got it and you think you've nailed it, you know, I mean, there were a couple of times when we said, wait a minute, what about this? Did we, should we look at this? Maybe we should dig a little bit, you know, and, and you find something, something else. Um, was the third question? How do you relate to life back home? Oh, well, I've been overseas now for 13 years, and so it's, um, coming back home is foreign to me. Um, Southeast Asia is home at this point. Um, you know, it's, I absolutely love it. It's, it was my dream to go there and, um, you know, I, coming back is, um, it's always kind of a reverse kind of this weird, going down the ice cream aisle in the grocery store is very um, strange to me because there's just so many choices and, and I think that when you spend um, so many years kind of living among um, all these different people from different countries and seeing oftentimes people um, in incredible poverty, but, you know, having this joy for life, you know, and, and then you come back here and you see everybody having, um, you know, so, so much and you think, do you really need to have everything that we have here to have, you know, joy in your life? And I think, um, you know, it's something that I think about sometimes when I come back. Robin? Um, I'll keep it short, I think. <laughs> Marjorie said a lot of the things that I feel as well. Um, I will say having a good fixer is 
like heaven. I mean, the people who will point out things that you don't even, you know, what this graffiti said. Oh, look at this, you know, point out things that you just will become the story often. They find the story. Um, and having a bad fixer, it's you just wasted your, you wasted your time, you wasted your day, you wasted money, you wasted everything. So, um, the second question when was, you stop reporting. when you stop I don't yeah you never stop um, because the story never really stops if you keep reporting you're gonna find something that will probably be the next story that you're working on or might come back to you you know five years later and and turn into something um, and going home. going home well I lived in Southeast Asia as well for most of the last 20 years so that kind of was home um, so it wasn't really like going home. I already was home at that time. <laughs> Elisa, you have the final word. Um, yeah. Well, I, I think everyone has said everything on fixers. You know, fi fixers are the the most important part of the of the picture, and if you you just have you have to have someone you trust, and um, you also need someone who really is basically smarter than you about the place and, and willing to tell you when you're wrong. And that's, that's really important. Um, on reporting, uh, everything's also been said. You never, you, never, you never stop. You have to write at some point, and then while your editor is editing it, you keep on reporting and then furtively change things. <laughs> Um, say, you know, we can't really say that because I just got one more piece of information that I just, that we, we just would be dishonest if we left it out. <laughs> um, and, um, and on when do you go home, I guess um, I haven't lived in one place and I've, I've worked a lot in war zones and I think when you stop thinking that something is a story, when you begin to say, oh, it was another bomb today, then, then you know it's, it's probably time to, at the very least, take a break, if not leave. Because if you can't see the story anymore, there's something amiss. Thank you so much to our panel. We learned a lot tonight. Thank you, Yanis, Elisa, Robin, Margie. And thank you to all of you for being here with us. And happy 100th birthday to the Pulitzer Prizes. Yeah. <laughs>